Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me in this discussion circle. Um, I know all of you from your comments to the um, videos that I've been putting up recently are actively engaged in all these kinds of questions. Um, and I've had some correspondence, I think, with all or most of you over the years in various forms. So um, why don't we go around and introduce ourselves so people will know who you are and maybe if you uh, right uh, on you, you write a lot of comments, let people know what who you are, the person you're commenting on, the, the, the form they see you in the comment sections, and uh, talk about how you got here and 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 all that kind of thing. So um, who would like to go first? I'm looking oh, at Dave. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. You woke up early in Hong Kong. So yeah. <laughs> sure. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the call today. Um, my name is Paul. I'm based in Hong Kong right now. Uh, and the comments I'm coming up is Paul Cal, C-A-L. My family name is actually Capo Bianco, but it's where I'm coming up in the comments. Um, I came across your videos, Professor, like 10 years ago, and I was in college undergrad at the time. And I was really interested in how you learn languages and how you knew so many of them. And I was really interested in the really analytic and academic approach you took to learning them. Because when I was growing up, I didn't really have that kind of background. I grew up only speaking English and I was always interested in other cultures, but never really was able to learn the language. So as I went through university and grad school, I kept learning and I came to Asia and lived in Japan, um, did some research there as well. And now I'm trying to figure out how to tie all of this stuff together in mm -hmm. a very academic way that I've mentioned to you before. Mm -hmm. um, so I was really interested in the first five to six minutes of your video last week, but the other content is great as well, but that's where I'm coming from. Um, so I've studied Japanese to a pretty reasonable level, studying Korean now, hope to move to Korea within the next year. Um, I've also studied Spanish, Mandarin a little bit, and um, got a strong foundation, some other languages, a little bit German and um, kind of dabbling in Russian now as well. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm interested in and I'm happy to be talking to everyone. Wonderful, thanks so much. Now, you and I corresponded at some point in, in the past, did we not? I remember writing letters. Yeah, when I was you, yeah. when I was in my PhD program, I think I uh -huh. reached out to you and I was studying anthropology at the time and I was studying foreigners in Japan. So I had the Japanese background and I wanted to incorporate more other languages into it. And at the time I was working with African groups in Japan and you mm -hmm. said, try That's to really cool. yeah. yeah, do that. But if you're going to do it, do it a little bit discreetly because people might not look favorably at mm -hmm. the effort to learn a lot of languages as a grad student. And that kind of mm -hmm. struck me as really um, unfortunate because as you mentioned, it's a great place to learn languages and other cultures and stuff. So, mm -hmm. okay, great. Well, wonderful to have you here. Um, Dave, you. you and I have also corresponded somewhat over the years, right? Where, when, did, when, did, when did we start doing that? And what's your current interest? Where are you? What are you up to? Uh, yeah, probably last mm, three or so years ago. You know, I think I think all of, I think everyone on all your videos at some point sort of through internet sleuthing tracked down whatever your current email address was and was like, hey, are you still around? Do you want to talk languages mm -hmm. with me? And, you know, it's obviously, you know, very... <laughs> Uh, appreciative you know, that you have responded to everybody, you know, with your own busy schedule. Um, so yes, we, you know, we've talked, um, I think you and I talked a little bit about some study skills as I kind of had some free time before I started my master's program. And I was like, severe case of polyitis, you know, can I learn Arabic and Japanese and Old Norse at the same time? And you know, like, well, you, you know, 15 minutes here and there, you can kind of do it. So, um, uh, so I got into, you know, your videos, yeah, pro like most people watching probably during the original run around 2011, 10, 11, 12, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and mm -hmm. because I had learned, you know, I, I was one of the lucky Americans that had a good Spanish teacher in high school. And most of us that took that class actually came out speaking Spanish. And, you know, throughout my 20s, it was kind of like, my favorite thing was when I would meet people in the workplace that were native Spanish speakers and I, you know, we could talk and, you know, communicate and connect on a different level. And so later on, you know, visiting Europe, going to Russia for the first time, I was like, you know, oh, I want to learn German. Oh, I really want to learn Russian. I'm going to learn Russian. Um, so I 
did. I started teaching myself Russian. Uh, when I did an undergrad, I did a Russian minor and you know focused on Russian history as my major. And then my master's thesis, which I just finished, uh, was on uh, early Russian revolutionary uh, thought, Marxist thought, you know, socialist thought if from Russian emigre groups in America and then in the early Soviet period. And so those of you will see me on the comments as David 1917. That's that's why. <laughs> um, and having finished my master's, you know, I want to go back into learning more Chinese, learning more, you know, Latin, ancient Greek, Sanskrit. I mean, the whole the whole deal. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to take a long time, but that's that's where I'm at. I'm I've, I've got the, the I've got the book. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you're going to die at some point when you're 70 or 80 anyway. So you might as well take a long time learning languages as does not take a long time. I mean, it's, you know, it's inevitable anyway. So <laughs> spend the time well doing that. Danielle, I feel like you and I might have actually, these guys have corresponded with, but I think, did you and I meet at like some polyglot conference somewhere at some point? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I've never taken part in any polyglot uh, conference. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm Daniel. I'm originally from Chile, but I'm now based in Bangkok. Uh, so also I'm early riser, like Paul in <laughs> Hong Kong. Uh -huh. um, so the first language that I learned, well, actually I had a similar history to everyone, basically. I'm a, I'm a native Spanish speaker. I grew up in a monolingual household. Um, in Chile, we study English like, as, a, as a second language in high school, but not very well probably very similar to the situation in the United States where Spanish is, everybody studies it, but never reaches, you know, conversational fluency. Uh, the first foreign language, well, foreign language that I was able to learn on my own was Esperanto, which some people consider it a language, others don't, but I don't know, that was, that, that was what got me interested in languages in general. And, and it gave me confidence to learn other languages because it was relatively easy. Like, I don't know, it took me about a year to already, you know, be, conversationally fluent in it and yeah I was first in high school I was more interested in computers but then my interest switched to languages and then I got a degree in translation soon after graduation I moved to Russia where I lived a few years I worked there as a, as a translator I learned Russian to a decent degree to the point where I was able to do translation work from from Russian into Spanish and state media then a few years ago, I moved here to Thailand, where I've been you know, working as a freelance translator ever since. And well, apart from Russian, which is one of my stronger languages and English, as you can hear, um, I also speak Portuguese to a decent degree. That's one of the languages that I study in, in college. Um, yeah, and I've been dabbling with a lot of languages, like Persian, Armenian, uh, also J Japanese, Chinese, while well, I'm not very good at either of those languages, Thai, which is probably a, a lower intermediate level. I can get, I can make myself understood, but not very eloquently or elegantly. But, so and, what, makes you yeah, be based, I mean, what makes you be based in Bangkok then? Um, it's, well, it's very easy. It's a very easy, it's a very easy to live here as a, as a foreigner. So it's kind of like a very friendly introduction to Asia in general. And I like the location. And I really like Southeast Asia, like the region. Uh, it's, it's very diverse. There are a lot of languages in the region to mm -hmm. you travel, just also a lot of religions. And I'm studying here in university. I'm getting a, a degree in Thai studies. In Thai studies? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. Great. Thai and Southeast and, Asian studies. And, and you do yes. translation or interpretation or both? From Russian I to am, Spanish and English? I am, or which? I am trained in both, but mm -hmm. for doing interpretation, I, I think I'm required to be based in a place where the languages are spoken. So for the I don't know, past decade or so, I've been doing mostly just translation. Okay, great. Well, um, wonderful to have you all here and to discuss the things that are of our, our common mutual interest. Um, as always, you've probably seen the, the preceding videos. Um, we have had a fair share of, of comments come in from people who aren't here. So I wanna make sure that we can um, answer any like burning questions and then we can all have a, a conversation um, as we see fit. Uh, I kind of originally thought it would be about an hour but they've been getting longer and longer and longer. So uh, I guess we've gotta be for about two hours. So I don't know, <laughs> guys are really up in the morning. Um, let's take some of the questions or the comments that people uh, had. Uh, Paul, I know that you said you're most interested in the poly literacy. Obviously, I am too, but I think that's the biggest question. So let's leave that for last. There's a couple of things I, I remember. Something's, somebody asking something about memory, something about bias filter. Um, 
if one of you guys could take the, that kind of question, if, you, if that's interesting to you, if you could articulate what, what that person was asking and also give your own, um, your own take on it and, and, and ask any something more about it. Uh, would somebody like to start us off on one of those things? Um, yeah, I have one. It's actually not one of the two that you mentioned, but it's, okay. it's from, from Yan from last week. All right. uh, he uh, asked mm -hmm. about people learning foreign languages, um, sp still speaking like they're speaking their native language um, and you know, making those kind of not fully shifting their voice into the, the new language. Mm -hmm. um, and he asks, uh, you know, you recommend learning phonetics, of course, but would you also recommend learning music? And that's something that I kind of um, sort of came into myself. You know, when I talk to people, people will comment, oh, you know, like, how do you, you know, do an accent like that? How do you get that kind of accent? I'm like, well, I, I've always good at like imitations, you know, my whole life and impersonations mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And then I'm a musician. And so that kind of plays into it as well. You know, I can hear the pitches, the tones and that kind of thing. And so for me, it's like the easiest thing ever, but I wonder if for those, do you recommend, you know, that people learn music? That's kind of a good question. I thought that he had. Uh, I, th I thought I talked about that a little bit in the video. I don't, I don't know so sometimes what I'm thinking and what I'm saying. But I, I think, you know, what I think about that is that I concur completely that uh, I have noticed that there are people who are able, you know, you hear them singing and then you find out that they're not natives in that language and you're surprised. I mean, they sound really authentic, but then sometimes you hear the same people talking and they don't sound as good when they're talking. So um, it seems to be something they can do when they're singing and not when they're talking. But if you can, it seems logical that if you can can do it while you're singing, you should be able to carry it over. So it's just a question of, I think, focus and concentration and attention. So um, I would I would say that if you're musical already, I mean, if you, you know, if you have the ability to play an instrument and read notes and, you know, if, if, you're, if you're musical already, then it would make sense to, you know, to explore that avenue as well and see if it helps you and works with you. But um, if you're not musical, um, I think that's adding a huge, um, you know, a huge extra load to carry. There are other things that you can do. Um, it's a nice thing to know to, to, to have music. And if it doesn't work for you for phonetics, then maybe you'll, you know, find out that, hey, you're a pretty good bassoon player. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's, yeah it, I think it's worth exploring. But I think I threw out <clears throat> uh, in the video that um, there's this, this acting with an accent series that is, to me, with this very similar to what my understanding of, of what singers do. Um, and that is, um, doesn't require you to, you know, to be carrying a note and doing it. Um, so uh, if you if you find that interesting and you'd like to explore that, but you're not musical, I, I think I put that reference out there as well. Um, uh, Daniel, what do you think about that? I mean, with your experience in professional translating, interpreting, you know, does music help you? Not really. And mm -hmm. I guess, uh, like going back to this argument about singing, I think that it's easier to pull a convincing accent when you're singing because there are a lot of elements of prosody of a, like spoken speech that are just not present when you're singing like the intonation mm -hmm. the, the 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 rhythm that you're supposed to follow the, the the melody you know rather than the natural intonation and and rhythm of the language so without those it's easier to speak with a passable accent or to sing in a passable accent but then when you speak and you don't have those other elements of not just the like the phonemes but all the other elements that all the package, all the, you know, that, that make you sound more like a native, they're, they're just not there. So I guess mm -hmm. that's why it's, it's, I think, I, I don't know, I, th I don't think it's a very good comparison. Mm. Um, also in translators, I don't know, most of the translators that, that I've met that are, I, I have a very, very solid command of, of both the target and, 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 and source languages. They don't necessarily have a good accent. Like I mean, they would have a strong Spanish accent, but then their command of the language would, would be would be such that they would be able to work professionally, no mm -hmm. problem. It's usually interpreters that require, especially simultaneous interpreters that require more, like that work more on their articulation. Yeah, no, that that the experience you just mentioned of it, your translators who don't necessarily who have an excellent understanding command of the language but don't have, you know, a good accent. And I've met, um, I I've met academics, professors who, you know, can, can do research and, you know, really read and write, but can't, literally can't speak the language. So, um, I think that, you know, if, if they have zero interest in it, then maybe that's okay, but it seems like a crying shame. But I, the fact that you, you know, th these people you're mentioning, they can talk, they're well aware of it, but this just shows how, I think, to the degree to which developing a good accent is, is just a question of 
talent more than uh, anything else and working hard on it in many ways. But if you have people who are good at the, you know, a good understanding of the language and, you know, doesn't, they don't have the, I mean, I, I guess these guys don't have bad accents, right? They just don't necessarily have good accents, which is it. I know it's just like a very like a re very like strongly like recognizable Spanish accent, but otherwise it's I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. maybe because I'm a native Spanish speaker to me it's, um, it's easier to understand and follow, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that um, the, both the book and the discussion is neglecting and that I've noticed in my experience because I've, I've worked also like part time language teacher in in Moscow and also here in Bangkok is so the psychological factor with like learning languages, because especially in Russia, I've noticed that, uh, for example, the, this um, dental fricative that, is, that English have this uh, words of think and they, those sounds in, in Russia are perceived as uh, speech impediments. You know, that's what, that's the way little children talk think. before yeah. they're sent to Lagapiet, you know, to the speech therapist. So although a lot, of, and I noticed that when I was explaining the sounds to, to students, a lot of them were able to reproduce the sound without any problem, but you could tell that they felt a little bit of self-conscious. And then when they spoke in front of other Russians, they would uh, retreat to the psychologically reassuring, you know, native sounds instead of just, you know, exposing themselves, making sounds that in their culture are considered ridiculous. So mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very, very big factor. Also here in Thailand, when I see foreigners, they, they, they feel the same level of you know, self-consciousness when they're trying to speak with tones. They feel silly and they just you know, retreat to the safety of their native sounds. So I think that's a big factor that is ignored. Psychological factor? And, yes, and, yes, yeah. yes, like self-confidence and, and feeling that when you're making, I, I think it's a, probably most students like rationally know that that's the way it's supposed to sound, but they feel silly mm -hmm. making these sounds and they would just resist yeah. producing, well, although they're capable of, of producing such sounds mm -hmm. in, in isolation, but then when they get to speak and where they get to perform in front of other mm -hmm. people, they feel shy and they just retreat to the safety of their native sounds. I don't know, right. That's my impression. Maybe. Right. I don't know what you guys. Uh, Hellman think. and I have mentioned that in this chapter, this section, but I know he mentioned it earlier. You know, the needing to be free from the fear of, of making, you know, perceived of making funny sounds, uh, and that being, yeah, a psychological factor. I, I think I, I I understand that. I mean, I see people, um, and I, I think it, talk about psychology and not being aware of it. I don't think they're aware that they're afraid that they're sounding funny, but there's cl they're clearly inhibited by something. Um, and just not really willing to, you know, sort of cut loose and talk and sound. Paul, do you have any thoughts about this musicality thing or tones or accents or anything here? Um, yeah, I know it was an interesting point about music. I never really thought of it myself. Um, I think for me, I don't, you know, I think as you mentioned, if you already are musical and you can play an instrument and you could recognize the tones and notes and such, that'll be a benefit in some ways. I think <laughs> if you're not interested in, in music though, like in learning an instrument, I think it would be, kind of going out of your way to to do it so uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I would probably learn an instrument just so I could get better at languages mm -hmm. but um I guess one thing that I was thinking about is how much effort should people like this could be a discussion question if you want to go that way but how much effort should people really put into trying to sound as good as you can versus and when to focus on it rather than just accepting the fact that we're going to be imperfect because I don't think there's like a solid answer to this and you know as you mentioned there are academics who can you know do research in the language or give a lecture in it but the pronunciation is not very good or even the grammar at times is very mm -hmm. not very good so I mean but it doesn't really inhibit our understanding of it so when I've been teaching students and stuff and they've asked about this question like what should I do and you know, is it a problem? I try to tell them, you know, first of all, don't try to sound like a native speaker because that's, you know, not really a reasonable goal. But I think if you're either your grammar or your pronunciation is inhibiting your ability to be understood, then I think it becomes a little bit of a problem. So mm -hmm. um, I guess that's what I would kind of say. And that's something I'd be curious about in terms of this part of the chat, the book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly concur with that. I mean, yes, I think people, um, some people can get too hung up on, on the issue of accent and you know not want to get started because they might want to get something bad or wrong. They're afraid of this particular sounds, the psychological inhibitions that Danielle was just mentioning. So um, 
yeah, it's, uh, as, as long as you are, you know, if, if your goal is certainly public literacy reading, you know, analyzing, you know, then it's, you know, it's, it shouldn't be a major concern. If you're more of a polyglot, you want to get out there and talk, you want to be an, an interpreter, well, then that's, that's much more of, of a concern. So I don't think there's a, a one size fits all answer for, for that. Yeah. And I guess there's a, a factor concerning the target language culture, because there are some um, societies that have a lot of uh, second language speakers of, of the dominant language, usually like societies with a lot of immigration or, or with a lot of regional dialects. But then there are other societies where it's, they're just people that are just not used to uh, hearing their language spoken by foreigners. So they would just mm -hmm. won't understand it. Like for example, here in Southeast Asia, like a, a, a famous case is Vietnam, but it's, it's Vietnamese are very, very like, unaccustomed to hearing foreigners speaking their language so they just they will try to understand you but they, it's just it's very hard for them to understand foreigners speaking their language so yeah. and here in thailand it's also that true to some extent but then there's more immigration from from neighboring countries and it's, you're likelier to hear thai being butchered by foreigners not just westerners but also from neighboring countries but still to a degree that that holds true whereas you know english or or even Spanish, you know, because there's like a lot of regional accents. There's like a very high degree of tolerance to like non-standard pronunciations of the language. So it's easier to achieve a pronunciation that would, I don't know, that you would be understood with in, in some languages than others. Mm -hmm. I, I think since, you know, you're in Thailand, you're now in Hong Kong, but you've been in Japan going to Korea. I've got experience in, in, in Korea. Dave, did you have any experience in, in Asia? Uh, spent like, 10 days in Beijing once. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's, I mean, let's just be, you know, call, you know, call a spade a spade here. I mean, basically human beings are in, not in a, not necessarily in a bad sense, but a lot of people are, you know, if they're from a homogenous society, they kind of, you know, if you if you don't look like you're from that society, it's not racism per such, but they kind of like they, they you're, you're never going to fit in. You're never going to be part of that society. Um, and so if you're learning a language like that, um, no matter how well you sound, you are going to run into situations, I think, like you, you just mentioned that, you know, people, they just have a hard time understanding you. I mean, I remember one time in Korea, it was a visiting Japanese professor and I was taking him around the city and we went, you know, showing him places and we went to a restaurant and he could not speak a word of Korean. And I've been there like, you know, seven years and I was pretty fluent in it, you know, and you know, the waitresses like in the West, they would not address me. They would address him, you know, because he, he looked Asian, you know, and I did not. And even though I was talking, it was like, it's, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, societies open up more and people are more like that. But I think that, you know, if you wanted to say, where should I put my efforts if I'm learning, say, an Asian language, I think if you can really develop your cultural knowledge and your cultural vocabulary and be able to have a really meaningful, deep conversation with the people about, you know, where they're from, that will open their eyes. That will, you know, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll appreciate that and they'll understand you more. Whereas if you just try to sound as much like them as you can, they're still not going to understand you sometimes so uh, I think it I think that's an answer partial answer too I mean if you're if your target language if you look like you could be you know a native speaker of your target language that's one consideration whereas if you are clearly an outsider um, that's that's another circumstance it's another consideration you know for how you know how much effort you might want to put into working on your accent I don't know what do you what do you guys think of that I um yeah, I, you know, like, especially when I first, like, when I'm, like, in Russia, after a few days, like, my accent gets a lot better, but the first couple of days, I'm kind of, like, getting into it, and people will think, oh, are you Ukrainian, or are, are you, uh, you know, of Russian descent, but you grew up in America, and one person once thought I was Azeri, it was middle of the summer, and I had been traveling for two days, so I was, like, really dark, you know, from being tan and stuff, and someone was like, you're from Azerbaijan, I was like, no, I'm not, you know, just, I'm an America that speaks weird right now, um, I, I had, I've had two different experiences with Chinese, though, um, like you just mentioned, Professor, in, in Korea, when, when I lived in Philadelphia, I would go to Chinatown with a friend of mine who was ABC from, but his parents were from Hong Kong, and he only spoke Cantonese and really like street Cantonese, not even, you know, eloquently. And I could like, I was learning Mandarin pretty 
well at the time. And so we would go in places, you know, the servers would put, you know, one set of chopsticks down and one fork down. Um, and then, you know, when it would come to order, he would try to order stuff in Cantonese, but if they only spoke Mandarin, you know, they would have this communication breakdown and I would be like, oh, I want this, this, and this. And then they would be like, okay. And then they'd come back and they'd still only address him. And then I remember one time some server was even like to him, like, do you even speak Chinese? And I was like, where have you been this whole night? You know, I, I can speak Mandarin and he speaks Cantonese. You know, we, it was just really funny. But in Beijing, everybody just assumed that I would, like people would come up to me and just start speaking to me in Mandarin, you know, just, because I think they're more in a more cosmopolitan society. And they're like, we're the center of the world. You know, we're the center of China. You know, it's, you, you, of course you speak Chinese. Like who doesn't speak Chinese, right? You know, <laughs> and so people would come up to me and just start asking me things or, you know, showing me, you know, at a museum, like, oh, what do you think of this or whatever? And I'd be like, oh, you just assumed that I could understand you. That's, I like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting about a few things I wanted to add to that. So like the professor's point where you had the Japanese scholar is showing them around Korea and they kept addressing the Japanese scholar. I know an instance in Japan where uh, a foreigner, he knows Japanese sign language and he was taking around a bunch of deaf J Japanese people and he was kind of translating for them at the restaurant, but they still kept addressing the Japanese people, even though they were clearly, he was signing to them and they clearly kind of knew that, you know, he was the only one that came capable of doing it. So I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, anecdote as well. Um, but what I think the, the whole sociolinguistic aspect of it, when you have someone from outside speaking the language, uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things that go into that and you know how you want to present yourself and how you want to come off in the language and the kind of vibe you want to give. There's so many different aspects that go into it. And I think, um, you know, it's just a very interesting thing. And as you mentioned that if you feel like you're always going to be an outsider, it's better to get that cultural knowledge. That's a very interesting point too, to think about, you know, how to kind of navigate that and just to accept the fact that you're never going to be, you know, accepted as being a part of the, the in-group and your language skills aren't going to get you there. If you are going to get closer to the in-group, I think that cultural knowledge is something that's probably going to take you much closer there. It's not the fact that this person can maybe, you know, they look like an outsider and it's not the fact that they sound so native that will do it. I think it's the fact that they do know so many things about deep in the culture and the sort of psychocultural aspects of the language and the culture that go together. Knowing them and being aware of them, I think, is an interesting way to differentiate yourself if you're seeking that. Yep. yep. Let's make sure we get to some of the, the questions. I think the most related one is, is it to this topic is uh, William from Brazil asked a long question about the bias filter, um, uh, sort of. I don't remember the, the details of that. Uh, did somebody have that sort of, uh, any any comments to add to that uh, in, in the learning of a language, a bias filter, setting your ideas out? What was he asking there, do you recall? Mm -hmm. so it was sort of an anecdote to uh, crashinism or something along those lines. It's like an interesting point. I've got it pulled up here if no one else does. I can kind of skim read it. Um, what are you saying there? He suggests, so he says, he calls it a filter because it stops the language acquiring device to receive um, so much, you know, basically it says so much is coming at you and internally you kind of say this stuff is important and this stuff is less important. Um, and so you will only learn enough to understand the messages. Anything that doesn't add to understanding the message ends up being distorted into patterns you already have in other languages. Things like gender, foreign sounds being simplified um, and that kind of thing. Um, and that's when you get into grammar studies, phonetic studies. Uh, he says, Krashen says it is due to the learner not feeling that he, she ha belongs to a group of speakers of the language, which is what we just kind of talked about. Um, he doesn't think that's an entire, the entire story. Um, I'm going to kind of skip around here. It's a lot, but, but even just starting from there, you know, um, yeah, you kind of get, get, okay, I, 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 I can get enough to understand this, you know, I can make myself understood. And so, so your de he, I guess the idea is your default position is to just try to be understood and then not to be obsessed with perfection, not, you know, in your nature isn't to try to develop a native like accent. And then, you know, in my own, you know, surveying of forums and these kinds of things, you know, there's always people that are like, how do I get a native accent? How do I do this? Um, 
And it's like, you know, why do you have to do that? That's, you That's know, that kind of thing that you mentioned, you know, in your commentary, you know, keep perspective, you know, what's, what's the most important thing here. Um, and I think maybe that's people overthinking the whole process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily know that to call it a bias filter, but it's just that with, as, as Hall articulated is, you know, your native language does train your muscle memory, train your, you know, train your brain in so many ways. And so um, I think uh, I have read multiple times that there are about maybe 200 sounds that are possibly used in, in various human languages, but, you know, your, uh, your average language, no, no language uses all of those, like a, a phonetically complex language might, might use 60, 70 or something like that. So a, th a third of them, but there are languages that are simple and only use like 30, you know, so um, there are those other sounds, you just stop hearing them. You just learn not to hear them. You can't perceive them. And so I recall a long, long time ago, some, somebody sent me a CD that was designed um, for babies to listen to. And this somebody did ask a question about this, I think, in, in the comments here. It, it had all the sounds, all these 200 sound, oh, odd sounds on there um, incorporated into various songs. And so if the idea was if you somehow played this CD in the background to your, while your baby was growing up, then your baby would learn to hear all 200 sounds. So um, I don't know how that worked or would work, but if somebody was working at that, uh, that, that appeals to you, Danielle? You get a big broad smile on your face when you hear that? Um, so when I was in university, uh, a professor lent me a, a manual uh, how do you, it came with audio and actually had a very similar, it was kind of like an introduction to the international, I can't remember the author and I can't remember the, the exact title, but I was actually trying to look it up before, like, when, because I wanted to bring it up. And it had, first of all, an introduction to most of the sounds of the International Phonetic Al Alphabet and some exercises, which were some like nonsense sentences that would make, and the sentences would consist in like very strange combinations of different sounds and with a CD to compare yourself with. And that was actually very useful to be, for me at least, to become aware of all the different parts of, of the anatomy of my, of all, all, like all my speech organs and, and being able to learn to consciously control them. I think that was very useful. And, and I guess that was kind of like close to that. And uh, also I had um, the, the, this previous topic about the bias uh, filter. Uh, mm -hmm. reminded me of something else. But I think like, human language, I mean, human sounds probably are like, like, like colors, you know, that, that one group, one speech group would uh, divide the, 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 the sound spectrum differently. So the same sound can be perceived as a variation of a different sound, depending on what your native language is, or mm -hmm. even what your native um, accent is. Like, for example, in, in, in the Spanish speaking world, there are like people from Spain would hear the sound sh, like the English sound sh, as a variation of an S, right? Because in mm -hmm. their dialect, the, 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 the S is produced like slightly higher in the palate. So it sounds like, like a little bit like Sean Connery, you know, like you're speaking a little bit like this. Whereas mm -hmm. to Latin Americans, that exact same sound would be perceived as a variation of a ch sound so but but just you just you know drag it a little bit longer and when you mm -hmm. hear like uh, like people with with an accent from those particular regions like spaniards would say english i speak english whereas latin americans would say i speak i speak english and then there would be like a conscious effort to drag this a little bit longer so i guess it has to do with also how you perceive like the, the, the your 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 own native sounds would mm -hmm. uh color the way you perceive the sounds in a foreign language and you would assign them a different value depending on where you're from. Also the sound the, like to Spanish speakers that just sounds like a form of the, whereas to a lot of Europeans that would sound like a form of the. So I don't know what you guys think about I, that. I think that's a people. great analogy that you just made that the way people divide the color spectrum and the sound spectrum. I mean, I can think of, and now Paul studying Korean too, somebody else to back it up, but in Korean, um, 
one of the words for, you know, they, they, they have multiple words, just like I'm looking at my colored pencils right now and there's all different shades of blue that I don't know what they are. I'm not, I'm not an artist, but I can go in and see these. So there are different words for blue and green, but the basic word for blue and green is the same in Korea. It's the same color. Blue and green is how can blue and green be the same? In the same way, R and L are the same sound in Korean. It's the same letter, real. And it just depends on where you put it, whether you make that. They, they seem like so clearly distinct sounds. R L is so different, but the, that's why Koreans have a hard time with them when they speak English from their bias filter or their native training. For them, that's a variation of the same sound. <coughs> to us, to me, that's a total, they're two totally different sounds. So Korean, they're a variation of the same sound. It depends on the position where it comes. The same way blue and green. Yeah, I mean they're they're both very different from from red or or, or purple. So I guess you can kind of see how they would come back and then. Getting into polyliteracy, I mean, yeah, you read that much, so much in Homer and Black, and the talks about the, the purple sea or the, you know, the different, the whole shades there of, of colors that, you know, were perceived in, in ancient Greek or, you know, are widely different in terms of the spectrum. So um, I think that's a really good, really good analogy you just made, Daniel. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think another good example is uh, Arabic loanwords in Persian that mm -hmm. would be spelled, you know, with a T or a TA and then and you pronounce them in Persian, they're written either, you know, with the, this T, but it's just T, and then, you know, the T with the dots, it's just T, you know, like everything was reduced into the existing Persian phonology, but they kept the mm -hmm. same spelling, you know. They kept so. the orthography, they keep the, they spell it the Arabic way, but they just pronounce it, you know, like. Yeah, yeah, like they that. don't differentiate the two kinds of T, the two kinds of S or anything like that. And so mm -hmm. that's another, you know, that's historically, also, they obviously just were like, yeah, that's, that's the same sound, you know, whatever. <laughs> Yeah. And that's also very helpful if you want to see like the etymology of other languages of this region, like for example, Central Asia or South Asia or even Southeast Asia. You can tell that like words that are ultimately like of Arab origin, they came to those languages through the Persian filter because there's, for example, Ramazan with a Z. Ah, that obviously came through Persian. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Paul, what do you think of that? No, it's uh, it's interesting. Um... I think the whole colors and worldview thing is interesting because in Japanese, the same thing, the lack of the differentiation between blue and green. Um, and I think going back, it's really interesting to be able to trace words like that as well. I didn't know you can do that with uh, looking at where the words from Arabic came from Southeast Asia, that you could trace them back that way. So that's pretty cool and interesting to know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I was more caught up on when you mentioned the color and the worldview of the people, like going back to Homer and looking at trying to understand the ways people were um, conceptualizing and thinking about colors. And you mm -hmm. know, that might be a really interesting topic for a study. You know, I was talking about the wine, the wine dark sea. I mean, I would never think of describing the sea in, in yeah. any light that I've seen it as looking like wine. I don't know what their line looked like back then. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, those, those color differentiations are are pretty amazing yeah so that somebody asked um because we're talking about older languages somebody said um what what do you think is the oldest language that has um like enough literature and stuff to 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 read it you know make it worthwhile to learn it and uh and what what languages are interesting along those regards and i think jan said it was probably egyptian or chinese and my understanding i don't i hope i'm not just perpetuating, you know, misunderstanding I once had, but Chinese probably should be really old, but it isn't nearly as old as it could be because Shi Huangti, the same emperor who unified China first and who um, built, started the building of the Great Wall, he ordered all the old books burned. He wanted to like start over with himself. And so that's the beauty of the Confucius's analects and stuff is that they sort of, um, took the old literature and condensed the best of it and put it into, you know, into one form. So we have like through the, one of the greatest minds of, of time, like somebody like Confucius is like, you know, I think when he ordered the books burned, it was under the death penalty if you didn't burn all your old books. But, you know, this is a, a culture of literati. Obviously some people hid some books somewhere. There were a few floating around, but um, given that writing developed in, in China about 5,000 years ago, you would think, well, we would have texts from 5,000, 4,000, 3,000 years ago. We don't, to my understanding. It's like we have the tradition starting, about, starting from about 500 BC and what Confucius and his people 
people like him are doing is remembering and writing down the old things, but um, really goes from that point. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's got to be. Uh, I think that we call them Assyriologists. It's not just Assyrians, but it's everything to do with you know that that the uh, the what's it called the Kaya shift the um, what is that in English the um, cuneiform cuneiform writing. Uh, Anything that's written in Assyrian or Sumerian or Babylonian or Chaldean, any of these older languages use that same script from Mesopotamia. So all of that is called Assyriology. And I think that there's a lot of literature there that's, you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the famous one, but there's, um, there's more stuff like that that I think is slowly being found. I don't I think it ever gets published as a bestseller, but the fact that that stuff was written on clay, baked clay, Obviously, um, you know, it's, 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 it's perishable, but it's not as perishable as papyrus. It's not as perishable as other things. So if a building burned down, um, the stuff would get baked even harder. So, you know, when, when places were destroyed and stuff, I think in the ruins of, you know, of Iraq and around that whole area, I think that people are finding more and more texts as, as time goes by. Um, so um, I think it might be either ancient Egyptian, obviously, or something using that, you know, from, from the Sumerian heritage, the, um, that form. But I've never really, really gotten into those as much as I kind of wanted to do. When I was at the University of Chicago, I lived right across the street from the Oriental, the Oriental Institute, and I was going to be a docent there one time, and I started learning um, Egyptian for that and some Assyrian, but it was just because I lived right across the street from that. That's something I can do anytime. So I'll do that tomorrow, I'll do that tomorrow. And then, no, nope, now I'm in Germany and that opportunity is gone. <laughs> so yeah, older languages are really, really beautiful and fascinating things, aren't they? We all agree on that here. And yet somehow time is going by and people are losing them and, and not having them. So that gets us to the description, the discussion, I guess, of, of why I'm calling these lectures polyliteracy and what I threw out there. People, a lot of principle resonated. I was just sort of not, <laughs> you know, having a preamble to the you know, beginning of my lecture, you know, just sort of uh, talking about, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and so I did uh, get a bit, I guess, autobiographical and look at, you know, where, where I come from as a scholar and how I got to be where I am. And uh, I've always had this uh, love of, of literature, but just as much as I love literature, you know, when I talk about great books, the whole great books tradition is not just poems, poems and, and songs and novels and stuff. It's also philosophy. It's also, you know, chap more, you know, books that are um, in the sense uh, when you go back and you look at somebody like Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book, and he talks about the different levels and types of reading and the importance of being challenged by a text. I mean, most people, when they want to read something, I mean, obviously not us, we try to read things in really hard languages that we don't understand yet. But most people, when they pick up a book, they want to be if not just entertained, I mean, the, the, the idea of being challenged by a book is not, you know, not really appealing, I think, to most people, whereas if you want to get something out of a book, it should challenge you. It should, you know, give you some, you know, uh, new things to think about. If it's a work of philosophy or, you know, natural, natural philosophy, natural history or something like that. So, um, yeah, I would not say that uh, polyliteracy and my conception of it is, is just, you know, Comparative literature plus comparative literature with a, a twist, but you know that's certainly where I started out. But if you guys have all been um, aware of my work and, and 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 internet presence for a long time, you probably remember on my old website um, that in my biographical section I talked about the fact that when I was an undergraduate at Columbia, um, I became more intrigued by you know the idea of what historical what philology used to be and I found an old syllabus for like when you were there in 1910 or something if you wanted to major in philology and you would learn Latin and Greek and Sanskrit and you know and you'd start on Old Norse and you'd go I mean it was it was just a much more wide-ranging um, area so I've always been interested in, in philology uh, as well. And then that whole linguistic, I think that was, was it uh, Simon uh, asked about, you know, could he wanted to write his master's thesis about that as I was saying, you know, couldn't um, maybe philology and 
linguistics also tie into absolutely definitely. And um, these are also things that I think he said, or maybe Paul in your comment, if you say that these might be, um, I think there's two problems in the modern academy regarding um, an endeavor like polyliteracy. And the one is just the limited scope, the idea that you cannot and should not, you know, be able to learn so many languages, the, the idea that it's just not possible to do that. There's that side of it that's, that is not supportive of it. it. says, no, you should, you know, either just conceptually, it's, it's not possible to learn that many languages as well, or just in principle, you need to narrow down, narrow your focus and become a specialist in something rather than having a broad scale. Um, and that's, so that's one problem that an endeavor like philology, uh, polyliteracy is, is faces in, in the modern academy. And the other is, um, as I pointed out in my preamble, that this whole, the contemporary spirit of, 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 of I want to call it the modern malaise of, of, of what, you know, academia is, has become the need to sort of take current contemporary hermeneutical trends and and then impute these things to the past and somehow be, be blind to the fact that you're doing that. And, and you know, and say so you must use, you, you can't enjoy the stuff that you're reading. You have to use it to, you know, to prove something that's currently a hot topic, you know, that it was there in the past as well. Um, and that's, I don't know, just to me, that's, that's just wrong. It's not, it's not fun. And it's, it certainly doesn't honor the spirit of the, the text. So yeah, it's a, it's a conundrum. Paul, this was your baby. What do you think about this? Um, no, I've agreed with everything that I think you've said like 100%. And personally, I've been trying to figure out how to incorporate that kind of philological training and background into my own education for the past decade. And I've not been able to really figure out the best way to do that. So, I mean, that's why it's taken me through anthropology, which is much more cultural focused, but it still didn't give me that like, real exposure to the languages and cultures that I wanted because it is much more theoretical and focused on producing theoretical articles, not learning languages and cultures. So it was a little bit disappointing in that way. I also went around to language education and applied linguistic stuff, but that there's some interesting stuff there. But for someone, for people who want to really learn languages most efficiently and to really absorb those cultures as we've been talking about, that too, it's still a far cry from, from doing that. And contemporary linguistics as well, um, it just doesn't seem to be so interested in language learning besides that very small niche of the applied linguists that are doing this. So, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything. And I, the reason why I'm so intrigued that you're making videos again and we're having these discussions is because, you know, what can we do? Those of us who are, you know, inclined to approach polyglottery, polyliteracy in this kind of way, you know, how can mm -hmm. we, you know, do something intellectual and academic and meaningful and contribute something while dealing with the current situation as it is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dave, you're thinking of going back to graduate school, so you're going to encounter all this. What are your thoughts on this? Well, that's, <laughs> that's weighing into my, my decision process, you know, um, I just finished my MA and I, you know, don't have any PhD applications in for this cycle. Um, so, you know, sometime in the future, that might be a thing, but yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes I think about it and I think, okay, in the U S you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to, it's, it's weird. You know, the U S undergraduate curriculum is simultaneously really specialized, but also they, they have all these broad general education things, which I don't know if they had them in the eighties or if they have them, you know, in other universities around the world now, but it's like, you know, you have to take like 40 credits of you know, sociology and history of the world and like all these other weird things that like aren't your specialty. So if you go in for biology and you're doing all this stuff that isn't, and it's, they want you to be well-rounded, but not in the way that, you know, you or I want to be well-rounded by learning Greek and Latin and Sanskrit or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, you know, getting into, um, I think, I think you can use modern or you can you can look at things critically and you can look at an old book and say wow like gender was different then you don't have to but you don't have to make a value judgment on it you don't have to say oh my god you know look at how you know bad this was you know there was a, a recent thing that came up um online somewhere someone put a review up of lingua latina per se illustrata and was like oh you know the the women are so you know 
uh, subjugated in this and all. And I was like, it's not like a commentary. It's just, you know, you're just learning vocabulary from it, you know, but, but what can we say from that? Okay, well, the Romans had these hierarchies that we don't agree with anymore. Great, we know that. But can we still, you know, just read it and enjoy it and learn Latin? You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's separating the two that a lot of people seem to have uh, trouble with. Um, and then, I mean, you know, the, in all the Soviet stuff, you know, the Marxist lens to everything, you know, the, the history of all hitherto struggle is the history of class struggle. It's any, everything is class, no matter what. And, you know, they even had this, you know, crazy biology in like the sixties or something that was, you know, trying to reorder biology under Marxist lens. And it, you know, it, it's gone by the wayside now, but you know, the people were really into doing that. And it, um, and so when I see, you know, certain things in the modern academy that are, you know, let's order things this way, or let's, you know, make sure you have this lens on it and this critical theory on it. And I'm kind of like, you know, I, I do a very specific thing. And that is, our, that's already a different critical theory, which is like Soviet Marxism. You know, I can't apply current, you know, gender theories to people get like, you, you end up with this like weird, um, like, I guess Matryoshka is a good word for it, you know, of, <laughs> you have critical theory and you have race theory and gender theory, and then you have Marxism inside it. It's all these different ways of looking at the world and you're trying to put them all at the same time. And it's just like, it, it's an overwhelming. And then you've lost sight of the whole thing. You know, I just want to, I just want to know what Lenin thought. I don't want to know what <laughs> someone now thinks Lenin should have thought or something, you know. Danielle, what's the situation like at the university where you're in Thailand? Um, I'm, I'm actually pursuing a bachelor's degree, so it's not really hard on the academic and publishing aspect. And I don't know, I've, I've given this some thought, like, do I really want to like go to academia? And, and I don't know, my reaction was like, it's because I agree with you, right? It's very hard to pursue a lot of some, some, some very broad interest in, at, the, at the postgraduate level, and there's this demand for specialization. So perhaps the best course of action would be to find like a professional job in, that, in which knowing a lot of languages is a decisive advantage. Like, I don't know, for example, like in, in business, being an account manager for uh, like, uh, pro, uh, uh, like clients that are from a very, like from a specific region and you speak those languages, for example. Mm -hmm. that, that I think that would be more like a, a realistic, a more realistic, at least for me, course of action. Like go in an area that, in a company that operates both in the former Soviet Union, Southeast Asia and Latin America. That, probably would be where I could combine, you know, my, my, my professional like, endeavors with my, um, with my hobby for, for learning language and leave all the ancient language stuff as a, as a, as a personal hobby, you know, that I would cultivate at home <clears throat> after work, you know. Well, that, that kind of job that you mentioned, I don't, I think they're, uh, I think they're pretty, rare in the first place, although Richard Simcott, who organizes the Polygon conferences, he had a job with some social media and he actually got, because he wanted it, you know, but he got the directed into the contract that he needed to use his, he needed to use 12 languages every day so that he, you know, would be sure to get <laughs> progress. So um, he did some- But, but it, it, it is, it is possible. I mean, I guess, I guess it's more yeah. realistic than, than yeah. you know, finding some academic, some, some, I don't know, some thesis advisors that would support me in right. some- <clears throat> But in a sense, too, it's also kind of like that, what we were talking about earlier about, you know, if you uh, the, learning a musical instrument in order to improve your, your accent. I mean, if you, if you have an interest in accounting or the business world or something like that, you know, where you could go out and you can do that, that's um, one thing. But if you don't have that interest, if your heart is, uh, is truly set on, you know, just, you know, being a, a scholar, a bookish scholar, then it's a more frustrating conundrum. Um, one I've been wrestling with and struggling with all my life, but I do think that what's happening right now, I mean, I loved the, the conversation that I uh, had with, um, I think it was after the second time with uh, Chase, who was from China, was there, and he was saying, where can he engage, you know, he was asking this sort of similar question, you know, where can he go to engage in these kind of questions, and Rebecca said, hey, we're doing it right now, we're doing it right now, um, and I do think that, you know, these past couple of years, 
this two years have been so weird in terms of the social re-engineering that we've had to, you know, just restructure the way we live our lives and just basically curtail so many of our, 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 our the things that we were accustomed to as liberties and freedoms. We just can't do those, have those anymore. And that's so odd. But on the flip side of that, I mean, again, literally what we're doing right now, I think I mentioned this in the lecture video, um, at the American University of the Emirates about three or four years back, the administration really wanted us to develop and deliver hybrid um, courses. They wanted us to have in all of our classes, we should give like one every two weeks or every three weeks um, should be delivered virtually. And there should be like, and then when, once you're used to doing that, the virtual delivery should always have like a camera on in the room and be doing this. And so people who couldn't make it could have it there. And so it was really kind of a strong arm tactic. And I don't think that the, um, the technology was quite what it, you know, I, don't, I don't remember what we used. I don't remember how it went. I just remember that, that I was not the only one who hated it. Everybody did. So we just we didn't go any further with that. Um, but this, um, in this past, last year, last summer, um, we had to develop and deliver um, courses you know, on, on, on Zoom. And so uh, where I was, one of the main thrusts was um, developing like high school credit courses uh, to deliver. Uh, and that was um, in the summer of 2020 when people had no option, people, uh, it took off. But since then, now that people do have an option and other options for younger people, for high school people, I think people have Zoom fatigue that just collapsed, you know, at least the endeavor I was here, no, there was no interest in that. Conversely, um, the best thing that I've gotten out of all this is I've developed and delivered these uh, reading and discussion courses. Um, I did it mainly in German literature thus far for adults, adult independent learners, you know, older learners who just, you know, wanted to be there. And I've, I'm keeping that up. I mean, that's just, that is an amazing way of uh, interacting with people who, uh, I think the, the phrases have been out there for a long time, lifelong learning uh, and, and um, continuing education, but somehow lifelong learning is, um, it's a buzzword when you're, you know, you're, you're, you're the university president, president is giving, um, his, his matriculation speech to the incoming freshman, you know, you're coming here to get a lifelong learning, but then it's sort of put aside and then it comes back and it's, it somehow it's, it's become an old age thing. It's for, you know, for, for retirement people. Um, and continuing education is also should be the same thing. You know, the whole idea of, if you read again, Mortimer Adler's introduction to the great books, he talks about it being a lifelong education, the whole process of continuing to educate yourself and read when you're outside of the classroom, the book becomes your classroom. The structured reading program becomes your classroom. Um, but continuing education, when you look that up, it means, okay, yes, okay, I'm, and now I learn how to be a flight mechanic, I'm learning a new skill, I'm learning a new trade. Um, but the, the vocabulary is out there, the concepts are out there for lifelong learning and for continuing education. And, you know, just like, again, you guys have said, I, I've had several incarnations as a, as, a, as a YouTube video maker, and it would never have occurred to me to have this sort of, oh, let's follow, you know, have the question and answer with a Zoom thing, actually get to know the people that are, uh, uh, you know, absorbing and appreciating what I'm putting out. I mean, that's just, that is a major development. So I think that we're seeing um, a flip side of the, of this, I call it social engineering, you know, what's happened over the past year now, this sort of way that we're able to interact now effectively with things like Zoom uh, is opening doors that I think didn't, they weren't just closed a couple of years ago. I just didn't know that they were there. You know, they were, you know, it's, it's a new way. So I think there are, there might be possibilities for um, engaging, um, you know, engaging the mind, engaging with other people, engaging the ideas, engaging materials uh, in ways that we couldn't in the past when we were, you know, geographically isolated and located. Now, how to translate that into, um, into um, if we want to stay scholar, into some sort of full-scale program or into something that like can support your life, you know, like, you know, something, you, these are, these are other things, but these may, these may come as well. But the, I think the first step is uh, to be able to say, yes, now it is possible to interact, um, communicate effectively, uh, in a way that we four are doing right now that uh, really just didn't exist a couple of years ago, so. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, I mean, you said a lot there and I'm gonna have to rewatch it to absorb <laughs> it all, but, um, and lifelong learning is a buzzword. So the thing that I've noticed is that all of that has to translate into 
skills that are something you can monetize mm -hmm. and being able to read and analyze Sanskrit is not up there. Not, not, <laughs> not something. And so, and so, you know, that, you know, we're up against like, you know, a, a cultural problem where self enrichment for the sake of it isn't really um, widespread as, as much as maybe, you know, we think it should be, or maybe it is, but not in the, in languages and, you know, ancient cultures and things like that. Um, and, you know, lifelong learning is okay. Yeah. Well, you know, because I'm a coal miner and coal mines don't exist anymore. I need to learn how to be X or I need to learn how to do computer stuff. I need to learn a new computer language. I need to like keep myself competitive in the market. Um, and, a lot of employers do that as well, even university level, you know, you kind of get the tuition reimbursement, but it's sort of, you sort of have to prove that it's applicable to your job or your position. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't just take a Persian class and be like, oh yeah, you know, reimburse me for this. You know, like, <laughs> How is that going to help you, uh, you know, track student enrollment rates? And I, well, and let, it's not, but you know, <laughs> I, like, well, I just want to learn my whole life, you know? So yeah, I mean, I think um, I don't want to slip into the cliche, uh, be the change you want to see, but there, there is, I mean, people have done this. I mean, you know, the podcasters, I mean, YouTube itself, you know, like people make their living off of making videos, you know, like some of them are kind of vapid, just like here I am at the mall or whatever, you know, and a million people watch it. But if you just kind of, it's, if you build it, they will come, you know, all these, all these things, you know, if you just start doing it, if we start doing it, if we have these things, you know, even if we all do it for free and just enjoy it, or, you know, one day it could spiral into something, you know, you'll have too many people wanting to come talk about poly literacy. And then, you know, you could structure a course and I mean, maybe even get it hosted through some, you know, some of these sites like um, Khan Academy or uh, I want to say Prager, but I think they're like super like political. So it might not fit in the, there, but um, what's the other one? The, Freakonomics one, I feel like they have like a, an online university or like edX or something, you know, they all have, there's avenues that you can create courses and stuff. And, you know, I think, I think, yeah, I think we are realizing, oh, this could be possible, you know? Yeah, it's very interesting that you mentioned that. I think, I think one thing that we have to kind of accept is the fact that the learning in itself, as you mentioned, is not like really looked at very highly so much anymore. And the things that are, the fields that are, the science, the engineering fields, those are much more in flavor right now. So I think recognizing that there's a lot of these sort of structural things that we would have to deal with, but I think having a more integrated platform for all of these discussions, just exactly like we're doing now, but trying to build on that and to expand it out and then just to look at how it naturally develops might be the best way to do it. And you, know, you mentioned like edX and other kinds of these platforms. And I think just more people getting involved and participating in the community, trying to publish stuff in different places, trying to get the word out, that might be the really only way to do it, given just the whole structural constraints that people like us would be facing. I do think that, the, you know, that since we're living it, it's hard to keep track of the, the pace of change, but it, it is just so rapid and there are just so many things that are just like, there now that aren't there and I you know I just every so often I get a physical reminder of of the way things used to be and and you know kind of I mentioned after I finish Hall's book maybe in January I'll do the same thing with uh, Gunnemark's book um, the, the Art and Science of Learning Languages but I recall that Back in the 90s, late in the 90s, in the early 2000s, you know, I just like somehow the names of Eric Gunnemar was like, somehow it was like a legend. Nobody knew who he was or where, how, how to get in touch with him. And I actually found a physical letter that I got from him, like when I first moved to Lebanon in 2004, and it has like Swedish stamps on it and it's long handwritten letter and, and, and just, you know, the, the difficulty of, of tracking people down in that whole enigmatic group of Amiki Linguarum. And, and just people really um, not believing that it was possible to learn multiple languages, truly denying that, you know, just saying that anybody who says that he's a, a polyglot 
doesn't know what he's talking about. Obviously, doesn't know what it means to know a language. It's just not possible to to learn lots of languages. Well, it, it can't be done. People really had um, that attitude, and I think that um, through th even through you know the you know people you know just sort of yes through the polyglot conference through all sorts of things like that. I think it's just so indubitable now that it can't be denied. I mean, some there are enough people out there who clearly, you know, have learned lots of languages that I don't think it's possible for people to deny that um, you can learn lots of languages anymore. So that's just a development in the past 10, 15 years. And so since we know that that's the case and we know that um, polyitis is uh, contagious and infectious, maybe we should go out and try to try to get people to catch it because once people catch it, then they get interested. Okay, okay, yeah, most people, yeah, I wanna learn uh, modern living languages, but uh, then they would hear talk like this and say, hey, well, maybe there's something into ancient Greek. And so then maybe, you know, and in, in a couple of years, Dave, Sanskrit will be something that's in, you know, high demand, you know, it's like Sanskrit will be like, um, um, uh, being a car mechanic, you can you know, teach people how to, how to <laughs> for I don't know. <laughs> Does anyone here know Sanskrit? <laughs> I, have I have a Sanskrit emergency. <laughs> I guess the the internet. I mean, I'm comparing it because, like I mentioned before at the beginning, that one of the first foreign language that I learned was Esperanto, and I, I learned it in the like in the early 2000s, 2002, 2003, and at that time uh, when like internet was becoming more and more like massive in, in other countries, you know, parts of the developing world. There was kind of like a small renaissance of, of the interest among like, it was easier to become in, like to get in touch with other Esperanto speakers all over the world because the usual met method was to find this like list of people that wanted to exchange correspondence, you know, like the old school letter. And if you wanted to write something, someone to the other side of the planet, that would take months you know, to get the answer. Whereas, you know, with all these new uh, chat services on the internet, it kind of like made it possible. So I guess there's, or there's like a similar, like, uh, I don't know, um, rekindling in the interest of learning foreign languages and also the availability of materials and, 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 and media in, in other languages. For example, I don't know, like when I was a, like a child in the 90s, it was very difficult to encounter stuff in other languages. Everything was adopted in Spanish or translated in Spanish. But now, like with any device, I can access pretty much like media in any language and I could like, immerse myself in, in other languages. So that kind of like facilitates the process of, of acquiring more languages. And also it, it helps people become more aware of the existence of other languages and also accessing materials. It becomes much easier. So I guess, I don't know, this is kind of like the, the, the result of that, like this, what we're mm -hmm. having here now. Mm -hmm. I, I think too, that there's some, I mean, it's just a hope, but you know, when, when, when studies come out that, like I think it came up in some recent discussion or one of my talks about, it, about you know, the, 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 the Alzheimer's and language learning link stuff like that, when people can see that there are other advantages to learning languages, like I tried to give my philosophical points in the, in the preceding lecture, you know, other reasons that you would have to learn languages. And I do think that there are, um, there are enough people out there who are interested in, maybe they're, maybe they're not, they're, they're not interested in languages right now as such, but they're interested in just sort of maximizing their human potential or human growth or or you know, just you know, in, in strengthening their minds, strengthening their capacities, challenging themselves, having some sort of um, practice. You hear that word a lot. I use that word a lot. I mean, a practice is like a meditative practice, or, or a sports practice, or practicing an instrument, or you know, something that you do on a regular, systematic basis. And I think that um, that certainly language learning is best done along those lines. And if you do it along those lines, it becomes um, a sort of a, a, a beneficial lifestyle thing to add and so I think that people I don't I don't it's every so often you still encounter people who think that learning foreign language is per se is a waste of time you know that you you, you know it's why, why bother but I think more common is people to think that oh yeah it's, they, they they give it lip service learning language would be a good thing to do but it's just not really 
anywhere on their event horizon interest, but if it could get on more people's event horizons, um, you know, just like, I, I don't think that you could earn a living as a, as a physical fitness coach, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, just people didn't, you know, but then people, more people started exercising, more people started running. Uh, and I do think that, you know, if, if people, could continue to develop. It's always been one of my concepts of language learning is a way of developing your a mind and developing a mental practice like that. Um, if that could become a more widespread popular idea, then there might be a job, uh, no joke, as not necessarily, well, I think Sanskrit would be a good call out there. People like Indian philosophy and stuff like that. And they would want to combine it with their yoga and their Buddhism and, and all these kind of things. And so it would just be a way to be sort of a, a life coach for, um, for, for mental development. As you say, uh, build it and they'll come. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's what I, you know, I always try to keep them, you know, one, the thing you, you kind of seem to always talk about is, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you don't want to teach people, like you don't want people to come to you to learn Greek and Latin and whatever. You want them to come to you to learn how to teach themselves Greek or Latin or Persian or whatever they want. And so, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I think on the old syllabus of the, you know, proposed academy from like 15 years ago, it was, yeah, we would learn German and French and Latin and Irish or whatever, but then that's just to get them used to learning. And then they, yeah. you know, have to, you can go home and learn whatever you want, you know, yeah. um, and you have that skill of, you know, self-study and and yeah i mean that comes into the practice i mean it's the same thing as you know a yoga teacher you know does you know teach you how to stretch and stuff but also hopefully how to you know center yourself and you know breathe more deeply into think and you know so you can do that you know you can go to the, a yoga class but then you know later in the evening or whatever you can you know take five seconds and you know focus on your breathing or try to center yourself and that kind of thing and so um same with the music same thing with physical fitness you know you learn a skill for how to you know pursue something like that so i mean yeah i do think that is an avenue and i think if you look at you know like, like you said putting it in perspective over time you know when you were you know kind of first appeared on the internet 15 years ago and started pushing these you know talking about you know your ideas on things and then even the videos 10 years ago were kind of like don't know if anyone's out here watching these you know and you know youtube had all its limitations and that kind of stuff and now it's kind of you know you you were like a youtube it gives you longer videos so it's a little more like relaxed you can lecture longer and you know you know there's an audience um mm -hmm. and so okay let's let's talk about the things i want to talk about you know <laughs> and, and so um yeah even even just you know through your own personal journey you know there's been a you know a seismic almost shift in like you know language learning and the study of languages and wanting to learn them or it's you know uh, opened up you know there was all these pockets of people latently around the world that like sort of thought about it and then you know that kind of like has kindled because they had access to it so um mm -hmm. yeah. yeah maybe that, you know that, that is the beautiful that's uh, i'm sorry i thought danielle i thought you and i had met at a polyglot conference have, have either of you ever been to a polyglot conference dave or paul no no that's that's just the amazing the, the first time you go there and you, you turn around and it's like there's 500 other people who are all obsessed with learning languages and like, i'm not weird or I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the only weird one here it's like we're, we're normal to here um but i always felt like there's like i mean there's no little polyliterate glitch there so maybe at some point you know i'm not going to organize it but you know somebody's going to have that you know if you get to a room it's like wow all these people are interested in sanskrit and old norse and you know and sumerian script that would be that would be um, possible because you said, I think that, yeah, there are pockets out there. There are little pockets out there. And now that we can all, I mean, you're in Thailand, you're in Hong Kong, you're in, you wanted to be in Moscow, but you're not, you're just on, on the East Coast. I'm in the Midwest. I've talked to people in Russia, in, in Greece, in Poland last week. I mean, there's no um, barrier to having this kind of conversation anymore. So I think that, you know, in terms of Eight billion people, you know, on the planet. If you know, you can connect with a couple of hundred thousand who are going to share this passion and interest. That's uh, that communication there is uh, more and more possible. But it, it never ceases to boggle the mind how many people still don't know about each other about different things. Just like that, you run into people and say, "Oh, I never heard of that." You know, so there's still 
um, not universal access to um, possibilities. Paul, you were going to say something? Um, yeah, no, I think on that, that last point, I think as well, like people aren't aware and I think there's not one integrated platform. Like, I don't know if there's any forms, like, you know, a decade ago, there was a how to learn any language form that seemed to be the place where you were posting. A lot of other people in the community were there and I've kind of fallen out of that, like keeping track of it. But I think having an integrated platform of some kind where everyone can go there and get access to different kinds of things is very helpful because then you have that way to communicate with people in a very meaningful way and i think that's why the your youtube channel right now is so important because we're having conversations with like-minded people on the comment section we're doing these discussions and stuff so it really is an important anchor in in the community so i think more places like this or one major one would really help facilitate that a lot i think hmm. yeah. Um, in, in order to do all this, we have to remember stuff. And there was one comment that we didn't, uh, I'm remembering now, we didn't get to. It was somebody named, I think, Stephen or something. Uh, what did he ask? He asked about, um, Simon said, no, Levon asked about memory limitations for the brain and how to avoid them. Did anybody read that comment or have any thoughts about that? I think, yeah, Dave? Yeah, it, I mean, I pulled it up here. You know, he says, um, you know, what he'll do is or um, have an audio tool that automatically loops sentences and chunks of phrases 10 times in a row as if it was a drone of noise and gives my brain enough time to internalize, understand, and shadow it eventually. And then Matthew, from who I think was in the first discussion circle, he'll kind mm -hmm. of say, that sounds great. You know, what I'll do sometimes is kind of I'll look at a word, you know, and say, you know, like, okay, this is such word and then repeat it in my head, you know, 10 times or something to try to, you know, drill it in there. Um, there are some people, you know, that on the, you know, forum community that are vehemently opposed to that thinking and most notably is the, the older Danish polyglot, I, uh, I forget his first name, Iverson. He, you know, he does this word list method and he says, you know, the last thing I want to do is sit there and say a word 10 times in a row. So, you know, I write it down and then try to forget it and then try to remember it the next day, you know? And so, yeah, just yes. kind of toying with how the memory works, you know, what are some, I guess the question, the question embedded in there is, you know, what are some ways to techniques that you have or something for this um, similar to the looping it 10 times or, you know, something else. Um, I, I guess kind of one thing, you know, we're talking about some of the, um, the, benefits of modern communications and technology and the like that it really is a two-edged sword and I think there's a lot of drawbacks to it and one thing about about the computer is it just it just sucks you in you know you'll just get you know get on there and and it's so easy you know when you're doing something with some some app or something like this it's 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 designed to be like a video game it's going to keep you playing and so um, one danger I see uh, in 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 using technology uh, as, as for learning is that, yeah, that, that inability to keep track of your time, the, the, the design to get you to stay with it longer. So I uh, still prefer, you know, old fashioned texts or, you know, audio that's not connected to, you know, some, the, the, the internet in any way, shape or form. But uh, so that kind of thing makes it easier to uh, track your time. And I think if you guys are all familiar with my earlier iterations, it's probably not the first time you've heard me say something like this. I, I think the best way to stop your memory from getting overload and stuff and refreshing is to, um, to change, change tracks frequently. Um, so it's, you know, if, if you're studying, you know, if you're studying Latin and Greek and you've got two hours a day rather than doing two hours of Latin and then two hours of Greek, if you, you know, you can do, 10 or 15 minutes of one, then 10 or 15 minutes of the other, then take a break and do something else and then come back and do it. Keeping that will keep it more active and keep your memory from getting overloaded and keep you from getting fatigued. And so that would be my basic answer to this is that um, rather than trying to do something for an hour at a time, uh, first and foremost, rather than trying to do anything on, on, on a technological device for an hour at a time, but period for an hour at a time, breaking it up into smaller chunks and you know, distributing it throughout the day 
um, I think is not just better for your memory, but better for the, the overall learning process for you know, making a, a language come alive in, in your head. So like for this person, you would say, instead of listening to it 10 times in a row, maybe listen to it two hours later, you know, and then two hours later. Mm -hmm. then, so yeah, you know, if you're doing, let's, you know, X amount, you know, some chunk of ASME lessons, do them first thing in the morning, Mm -hmm. and then do the next set you know in the afternoon with you know the overlap or whatever and, and so on yeah and you know that kind of makes sense so mm. yeah I, I can kind of resonate with Iverson there saying you know, the last thing he wants to do is hear the same sentence 10 times in a row um you know when you're if you've got something and you know and in the past long, long times because I'm thinking about Korea now because Paul's going to Korea I'm just thinking back in in those my linguistic monastic days and I would go running in the morning and I would just listen to the same tape every day and, and just really internalize it and that didn't bother me in that way but and I, I think that was a good thing and a good use of time but I think now on, on this same thing if you're sitting inside and you're doing something um, rather than listening to the same thing every every two hours um, doing something different also with it I mean hearing it in some other way and I think you know ultimately um, I think this came up in a couple of, I forget it was the previous discussion or something, or just the whole idea of, of for polyliteracy, learning to get some sort of sound in your head to sub-vocalize so you can read things and, and make it come alive. But that doesn't mean, so, so Hall says you need to learn how to speak before you can learn how to read. And, but that doesn't mean you need to speak or I need to have a full-blown conversation. It means you need to be able to shadow a tape. It means you need to be able to get the sounds. You need to be able to say something. So I think that um, one piece of advice that I could give looking at myself now as I get older compared to what I did when I was younger, I think I probably spent too much time listening and not enough time reading aloud. The older I get, the more I think actually reading aloud is, is, is better than listening. So you can't read aloud when you're running. So yeah, if you're gonna go for a run, take it and listen to it then. But uh, when you're inside sitting you know, down, yeah, there's a time when you should listen. There's a time when we work group, but just as a repeated thing to do, rather than listening, um, even if you're working with the same material over and over again, trying to internalize it, read it aloud is, is reading aloud is more effective than listening multiple times. And Daniel? Uh, in my experience, I mean, I haven't learned a lot of languages, but when I'm studying a language, I find it very very boring to repeat the same thing over and over and what really works well there are a lot of things that work sometimes like like doing anki reviews would do the trick for some words but then there are some other words that just they wouldn't they won't stick no matter what so for those words what really helps me is um recognizing them in another context like there, there's this passive understanding of the word that I can't really, but then when I see it in another context, I'm like, ah, this word. And this kind of like, ah, moment it creates some impression in, in my head and kind of like really, really helps me remember. So I guess using a lot of materials, basically like spread, you know, horizontally, you know, you read a lot, as much as you can at that level. Like, for example, if you're like at the beginner level, then get as many, you know, beginner courses as you can. And then if you just finish with the lesson one of your main textbook, then go to another one and review, not by rereading the first textbook, but just by reading the same, you know, unit one of the other textbook and so on, you know, and then you rotate among mm -hmm. these, you know, four or five textbooks. That, that, I find that much more doable. Absolutely. Absolutely. That rotating and cycling is, is indispensable. No, no questions asked. I mean, if you were to do the exact same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, that would become deadly boring, but... Um, again, this is, things just keep coming up. I mean, for autodidactic learners, one characteristic that just naturally, whatever different styles I've had, is that people use a variety of different le courses at the same level compared to taking a course at university where you enroll and, you know, you buy the textbook that the teacher tells you and you, then you finish your, you know, level year one, you go on to year two and you don't use two year one textbooks, but when you teach yourself a language, you, you do you get four or five different books and you, know, and you compare and you get the material presented in different aspects and you don't spend as long with each one of them, but in that way too, what you do is you cycle through them, you go, you know, you go through them. So yes, you would 
say you have the recording material from one method, one course, you work with that, you internalize it, you move on to one other course, a third course. Then when you come back to that, you listen to it, you haven't heard it for a couple of weeks uh, and it's, you know, and you have gotten a better, deeper understanding from working with the other materials. And so when you listen to it, um, it's not the same thing. You, you can appreciate it at a new level. You can understand things you didn't understand before, so. And also not just with textbooks, but using like material for native speakers, like, like watching a movie. And even if you know very little, the fact that you're able to recognize the sounds or identify one or two words that you just saw in your textbook, that kind of like motivate, at least in my, in my case, motivates me to, you know, keep learning or being, seeing the, the, the fruits of my learning and experiencing them. It's a, this little tiny baby steps that now I recognize this word in a movie, or now I, I'm listening to a song and there were like two words that I that I was I'm able to recognize. Also, that thing you know like helps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul, how are you going about learning Korean? And now you've learned Japanese and now you're moving on to Korean. How are you going to be doing that? Um, yeah, well, I've done it pretty much all on my own, and I think it's mm -hmm. a perfect transition to the comment I wanted to make anyway. But mm -hmm. I um. Yeah, I've been I've started studying Korean about a decade ago, but didn't really keep with it consistently. So I've kind of been going in and out with it. But for the past three years, I've been studying it a lot more seriously. And it's all been on my own through books and different materials that I've had. And I came across some materials online from I, like Sejong on a hot dog, something like that. What it, I'm not language school materials. And there's absolutely no English in any of the books. So everything is all in Korean. Um, so it's great for listening and getting the input, but for learning the grammar, I mean, the grammar explanations are not so, not so good um, because they're all in Korean and they're very vague. So um, when I'm going through that material, I have found it really helpful to do exactly what you, everyone has just talked about. So, you know, go through the material. They have them through all different levels. So from beginning levels to more higher levels. So going through the content, going through it, and if there's something you don't know, this goes back to what we talked, you talked about in the lecture and Hall talks about as well, like sort of how does the grammar interference come into what you're doing and what should we do about that? Because I think in the comment section, uh, I personally said like, if there's a grammatical pattern I don't get, I usually just kind of skip it and don't get hung up on it. Whereas Hall, I think mentioned mastering the lesson before you moved on. I always found that to be very detrimental. So I just kind of push forward, you know, and a little bit at a time, recognizing words from different places and recognizing that oh i learned that word here and now i could apply it there or now i've you know learned this vocabulary and now i'm seeing it in a wikipedia article i'm reading something like that so i think um yeah really just pushing through it and kind of jumping around if there's grammar i don't know i try to ask people about it but you know korean grammar can be so complex even if you ask native speakers they don't often give a very solid explanation of it so i think rather than try to master it and get perfect at it it's better to just move on and come back to it later because for the Japanese I found like some of the grammatical patterns I just kind of pick them up from being in Japan and using language so I think that's kind of the approach that I've taken with Korean as well and I, yeah mm -hmm. and I think that I'd like to kind of if we have time and people don't mind but you know going back to everyone who here who's studied Russian like if you're studying Russian and the complex grammar comes out how do you how do you deal with that? Do you try to master that grammatical, you know, the cases and right there, or do you just kind of move on from them and kind of circle back to them? Like, because I'm personally intimidated when I look at the book, like as you mentioned in the lecture, professor. If you look at something and you know it's overwhelming the amount of grammar that goes into it, you know, how do you how do you even approach that to begin with before getting discouraged? Okay, well, we've got a, an expert right here, Danielle. How did you do that? Um I ignored for a long time. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I ignored that for a very long time. What I focused, actually I got this, I don't know, insight because my first, um, my first encounter with the Russian language was through PIMSTER courses. Yeah. And they don't introduce any grammar. They just teach you, teach you uh, fixed phrases. Like, uh, like, and you kind of like recognize the words and, and, and you kind of like know that it's the same word just with a different ending, but you just know that in this particular context, you would use this form of the word without actually having to memorize the whole paradigm at once. And there are some like endings that you barely use. Like for example, I don't know, if you wanna decline higher, like 
some like numbers, for example, like uh, through 325 votes, like three three and twenty-two голосами. Like that's that's kind of like an ending that you would never use in in, in your everyday life. So that you can put off, you know, that for later. And just and there's there was a, a Soviet um, language teacher that was who was kind of famous in the United States. Um, he had a German surname, I think, Boris Schechtman. He had a book where he explains, he introduces the concept of island. And that's just like little fixed phrases or cliches that you say all the time. And that, and I don't know, using that approach, trying to just memorize a bunch of fixed expressions or trying to practice the paradigm, but with a preposition. Like for example, I don't know, you would use one preposition and then you would just use different words with different adjectives, trying to like drill the pattern. That's kind of like how, I did it, but I uh, know I didn't really give it much thought. Yeah, that's like the kind of making mountains out of molehills thing. You know, someone mm -hmm. could tell you, oh my God, there's all these cases, there's this and that, you know, aspect and, you know, who who knows what else, you know, likes, lur lurks beneath these pages, you know, um, uh -huh. and, you know, just do it, you know, like, uh, and you're going to, it's going to be, you know, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, you know, that's, that's, you will mess up. make a lot of mistakes, just do it. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, what I did, you know, I'd kind of notice, be like, oh, you know, like that, that word changes, but this word doesn't change in the same context, you know, it's like, oh, okay, well, that's, you know, feminine and the accusative changes, ad, ooh, and then, you know, the masculine doesn't change in the accusative. And, you know, some grammar books are really funny. They'll start out like, put all these masculine nouns in the accusative and you're like, that's the same you word. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's like they <laughs> train you really with it, yeah. But there's a, yeah, like you said, you know, uh, I was thinking about this a lot lately um, in, you know, learning language islands or, you know, chunks or whatever. If you think of, you know, three Russian words for why you have, you know, and then you, a roundabout way of and the, you know, that's more like what for, but it's still like a why, but those are all declinations of, but mm -hmm. you, you don't, think of them that way you just think is a gym you know or put you move you know you just you just say them that way and so you can just get you know these ideas and you know go you know go with go with them and how they how they work you know you know the svidanya you just learned the svidanya and then you kind of realize oh like svidanya okay. is like you know a meeting and like dos vidanya is like until a, a term, genitive meeting you know like these things come later and so with any of the kind of case stuff yeah i mean a book can start out you know with a mountain and just say like you know here there's all these cases or whatever but you know a well put together program you know like an sml or something like that and you know in the sml ones what they'll do is they'll say like notice how this is changing we'll tell you later you know <laughs> just just go with it um and it but that's i mean i think that's great i think that's what worked out really well for me is you know you kind of get all these things and then you like realize okay you know every time you don't know, maybe not, not even know the word, you know, object, you know, and accusative and all this thing, but you're like, anytime, you know, I have a kaniga, it becomes a kanigu, and that, that's just it. I just know that. And you go with that. And then, and then finally you can get to the drills, but once I think start, you know, some mistakes that I've made, I've, you know, started some things like um, Icelandic and I was like, okay, let me try this teach yourself Icelandic book. And it's just paradigms and paradigms and put this and I'm like, I, I have no context for this, you know, this, this is terrible. And so I put that away and, um, you know, been doing the linguaphone course and I'm like, okay, you know, now I'm seeing things and I'm getting some context and, you know, I'm seeing the relationship with other Germanic words. And, you know, I'm going to get back to that teacher self book when I finished this course, you know, some other time, but on the face of it, like that book is, is the worst introduction, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, that's, that's my suggestion to you for anything complicated is just dive in and see what happens, you know? And, I mean, if you are fascinated by grammar and you want to get it right, I mean, this is back to hall and, and pattern drills and stuff. Pattern drills are perfect for Russian. And there are lots of <clears throat> books from you know, Foreign Service and Defense Language Institute that have pattern drills for them, um, Cortina. So getting that and doing that and being aware of that. <clears throat> and, you know, just as I said, you know, any, any language, just noticing one thing at a time. It's like, okay, what should this be in the... You know, in, in the instrumental plural, it's how, you know, I, I, you know, I, I know this is irregular that the, the, 
the tonic accent shifts here. What's it's going to be? So you can make mountains out of molehills there. You can be aware that this is, but it's also, that's part of like saying, I would like to speak this really fluently. I would like to not make this mistake. I'm aware that I'm making a mistake. I'd like to not do it. Um, <clears throat> so and there's something. Uh, uh, I'm just um, sorry. Let me. Uh, okay. I just remember that. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. What were we saying? No, no. It's that this mountain out of molehill situation, and I think it has to do with a. I don't want to use the word ethnocentric, but uh, like probably the authors of the textbooks, and there's kind of like a, a Russian language teaching tradition in Western countries, and mm -hmm. they tend to put way too much emphasis on the differences to the detriment of other things that aren't as exotic but are very difficult to master like i, I have like two things that come to mind uh, vocabulary russian vocabulary with the uh, prefixes all this you know glagol is pretty stuff to me that is i don't know that for me at least that was one of the more challenging aspects like like besides not besides that besides you know piri besides like all the nuances in meaning that you get with uh, all the different prefixes that's that's something very difficult when you're at an intermediate level another thing that is like neglected in most like textbooks is pronunciation beyond the very basics to make yourself understood like there are like for example vowel reduction is never properly explained apart from okay in russian and there are like a lot of nuances with vowel reduction that would, if you were aware of them, you would have a much better accent, but they're just not explained or, or, or some like, uh, so that's, that's one thing, you know, that I think it's yeah, I too think, much focus think, on the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that's that's another thing that I think can be over explained. I see that in like Chinese, you know, that, you know, oh, you know, third tone becomes second tone and third tone becomes fourth tone and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I think if you just listen to a, enough Chinese you could kind of you could get it feel it out you know and then and then read something <clears> about it and see okay but you know if you start out you know like oh my you know and I, I see forum posts that are like yeah you know how how does this third tone become the second tone in this sentence but not in this sentence and you know and I, okay you want to like figure out the minutiae right here but if at the beginning when you're like how is this going to change you know how do I know if it's going to change you know, just listen to some more Chinese and you can you can get it um one thing, you know, I like that you mentioned, uh, Danielle, on um, similarities uh, is, hi yeah, highlight those up front. I mean, for, you know, because that, that's what, you know, I feel like good Spanish and French teachers do. Every A-T-I-O-N word, acion, it, acion, Asian, you know, that's association, you know, proclamation, declaration, you know, declaración, proclamación, uh, and then you have those in, in Russian, you know, they, they might not be used as often, but like, you know, you have the declaratia and you have, you know, every, every Latinate A-T-I-O-N word becomes an atza e ya word, you know, and so let's, let's start with some of those, you know, kind of get people, get people's feet wet, thinking some words and, you know, thinking, and especially you could think, you know, oh, I'm using like this lofty concept, you know, I'm talking about constitutia, you know, in Russian, mm -hmm. that's so cool. And um, especially the other thing is people, Sometimes I'd help talk to people in Russian and they're like, that's a whole different alphabet. <laughs> that's nothing. You know? Wait till I tell you about the date of plural. But, uh, but start, and start out with all these full, words that like, you know, you know, and let's go from there. It's not even a full different alphabet. It's like half an alphabet. Like, exactly. Yeah. That's, <laughs> but and then, and then let's give you a hundred words you already know. Every A-T-I-O-N word and A-C-I-O-N word. You already know those, mm -hmm. you know, let's talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. them. Yeah. I, I think another thing to remember about Russian, Paul, too is that um, it is it's a language that has been like there's 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 zillions of people who are non-native Russian speakers who are speaking it and so they are like Paul David was mistaken what were you mistaken for Azerbaijani or something I mean there's people yeah. from all over the you know the former Soviet Union and Central Asia stuff like that who you know their Russian is probably not perfect either and people are used to hearing that so I, I don't think that um, that I, I think that in terms of those mountains, I think there are more in your mind. I'm aware that oh, I, I, the, this grammar is really complex and I'm not, I haven't totally mastered. I hear myself making mistakes. I don't like it, but they are not unused to hearing people. They won't misunderstand you because of that. I had two experiences in St. Petersburg about 15, 16 years apart. One is when I went there by myself to do like live with the family and have private one-on-one -on -one tutoring six hours a day and was totally focused on like 
trying to get as perfect as I could and, and working on it. And that time I was like really aware of all these, you know, grammatical issues and mistakes. And I had a teacher, a teacher and I was working on it with it and I made a lot of progress. But then I didn't focus on Russian to any degree. I mean, I moved on to, to Arabic. It was like, you know, it's not something that, and then in the uh, summer of 2016, I believe, um, I, I, we just went there, my family, my wife and my sons and I went there and spent our summer vacation there. So we rented an Airbnb and stayed there for a month. And, you know, just like they had never been there before. And we saw the museums and stuff like that. And for me, I knew I was going back to a linguistic situation, but it was one that I hadn't practiced. And so I was more aware of, you know, just because that was, that's the way my mind works. I was like, okay, all that complicated Russian grammar is it going to be an impediment or, you know, I'm going to work on it. So I did, you know, take my old textbooks with me and was brushing up on it. But, um, you know, we, our Airbnb was, kind of, it's a big city. Our, you know, it's like you needed to take a taxi into the city to like go to museums and stuff like that. And so um, every morning I would, I would call for a taxi and, you know, we'd ride in and like the first day I just like sat there next to the driver and you know, the next day I was, why don't you, you know, this is an opportunity to have a conversation. Why don't you talk to these people? And so, um, I, the next day I started doing that and it, you know, and it just, it was, it, I mean, A, there's a lot of Russian taxi drivers who are poets and musicians and stuff like that. I mean, there, there are a lot of really interesting conversations you can have with people. Um, but B, once you just start talking to I me, mean, it's just like, oh, oh that, that obsession with, I, yeah, I could, it's like, I can, I can get on the phone and I can make phone calls and arrangements and stuff like that. I can, you know, I can communicate, I can do it, I can go to the bookstore, I can buy the books that I want to buy, I can track things down, I can look through things. It, it works, you know, so that obviously I'm always noticing and trying to improve things. And I only had a month there to work on it. But once I sort of got over that initial hang up, oh, I, if I try to speak, I'm going to make a mistake. I shouldn't. So maybe I'm not going to speak. I'll just, just speak. And it worked with all, all the background I had and the stuff that I'd done. So yeah, I do think that that I don't want to make too much of a uh, a mountain out of the molehill, but I think that 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 it is um, that, that is an issue there. Yeah, I think just being aware, you know. I mean, obviously, that you know, Paul, you study Korean, and you know, people are. I feel like when I you know hear that, people are like, oh, there's like twenty five hundred, you know, ways to conjugate every verb based on social class and all that, you know, all these things, and that you know that sounds like crazy, but that probably follows a pattern, and you probably get it, you know. Uh, so I would say Russians, you know, similar that it just has its own quirks that you just, you'll get. Well, that, that's my fault. What you just mentioned, Dave, because I noticed that. And when I was there, so I wrote the Korean verbal conjugation handbook with the Korean linguist. And the way I wrote that is like, you know, it's like you, you learn, it's just, it's not in any textbook. There are all these different verbal endings that are not anywhere. And then once you start reading, you start encountering all these things. And then you go to a Korean and you say, what does this mean? And they're like, oh, and they can kind of sort of explain it, but not really. So you have to go to a grammarian. And how come it's not in any textbook? They almost didn't consider it grammar because these were like maybe colloquial spoken endings. Mm -hmm. And it's just like not well, I think in like a, so, yeah. yeah. Having a resource book is good. You know, like the um, the, Bus the really good Buska Falag, um, Icelandic, you know, book of paradigms. That's mm -hmm. interesting and to, to clench because there's so much irregularity it's you know you need this but this shouldn't be your first thing this is you know next to your dictionary and reference grammar you know and so um but yeah you know when i see like forum posts or you know read you know introductions to korean language that's the thing that always gets brought up is mm -hmm. you know all the verb all the verb possible verb forms and we're in japanese you know there's so many honorifics and so many class levels and stuff and you, that sounds crazy but then once you get into it you're probably like oh that's how we do you know just working through it and keep going, keep going at it consistently over time is the best way to do mm -hmm. it. And, you know, if you could find access to decent materials that can explain things in ways that help you to grasp it, I think would be really helpful. Cause it's the same thing with the, the Korean, as you said, professor, like if you ask people about things, they've never thought about why this grammatical marker may function the way it does. And if you ask, well, mm -hmm. how is that different from another one? It can be very difficult to explain how to use it. So I think, being able to have access to materials and even kind of putting together your own materials for some of these really obscure points. You know, I'm, I'm someone who likes to hear things a lot and a lot. So like the comment before listening to something 10 times, I think that would be something I would like to do, you know, not every, you know, maybe once in the morning and then the next day play it again. 
but I think developing materials that are really conducive to learning is another interesting way that polyglots and polyliterates can kind of contribute to, you know, furthering things like creating good materials. And it's a different discussion, but, you know, I think that that's important and just pushing through with making and having good ones is super important for getting over these hurdles grammatically and, and parts of the language that are very unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but since you, since you dredged up my memory there, I mean, back to the Korean verbal thing again, it's like, these were things that, in a sense, you didn't need to know. Um, as Danielle, Dan, you mentioned something about Russian, uh, so some ending that you didn't really need to know. I mean, if you wanna know everything, you need to know it, if it's there. I mean, um, but probably, um, I mean, it, because these were verb endings at the very end, uh, you know, I understood everything else in the sentence. You understand what the verb is doing. It's just obviously it's putting a nuance. It's putting a color. It's putting a flavor on there. So um, it would probably be something that probably the best thing, the best way to have done that would have been just to stay there forever and read a lot and just keep reading, reading, reading. And, and then it would become as second nature to me as it would be to a Korean who wouldn't notice them, but would just have a feeling for it. But what I did is I started like reading them and it's like, oh, here, right, I write this down. I haven't seen this one before. And then I took it to my colleague, Professor Kim jong Nook, and he's a Korean linguist. And he's like, wow, yeah, this is interesting. Let's put it in the cat. So we made that book together and, you know, went, went out and, you know, and for me, it's just like now I've created this mountain of all because now people can say, look, it's a book with like 700 different endings. And the real, the only reason there's only 700 is because like on the biggest page, that's all we could fit. There's like 900. We couldn't put the other 200. There. But, but my colleague there, he like got like a huge, huge boost to his career as a Korean linguist in Korea with other things by going to conferences and presenting this and people said, like, how did you notice these things? He said, I didn't notice it. He did. This American guy did. I explained it. He noticed it. I explained it. And so working at it that way, we, we got something out of it. But um, it's not something that you um, need to know to, to learn or communicate it. Again, it is, it is back to polyliteracy. It's, it's something that you see in writing. Uh, so if you want to read, uh, it's something you need to have that reference book with you there, uh, but probably it is something that just by, uh, because you can, you know, you can follow the, the, what's going on in the story. It's something that you could probably get over time just by reading a lot. So, um, speaking of over time, we have, we, we, I think now we're at the longest one yet. Uh, have we covered everything that we want to, to cover? I mean, we've got your din dinner, it's, well, not maybe dinner time for you and me, Dave. It's breakfast time for you two over there. Uh, <laughs> um, pushing people's patience. Uh, how long are they going to watch us? I hope this is interesting for everybody to watch as I mm -hmm. have. Anything that you wanted to ask or talk about that we didn't cover? Um. About, I mean, about the, the, the original uh, topic of the book about like uh, phonetics. Um, I, I've always had this impression and this feeling that most textbooks do a terrible job in explaining the sound system of, 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 of any given language. And even, and I'm, I'm, my first impression was that because they don't want to overwhelm the, the beginning student, you know, but then like when you keep progressing, there are like a lot of, very important details so the pronunciation there are just never explained they're like just assumed and just to give an example um in spanish we have uh, an allophone of the sound the which exists in english it's the but this is never explained to intermediate uh, native english speaking learners of spanish so they end up saying something like empanada with a with a plosive the and they're never explained that they could just use a sound that is in their you know inventory like if, if they just said empanada that would sound much better but it's never explained and that happens in a lot of languages like for example like i mentioned a while ago about russian like vowel reduction is never really properly explained apart from the fact that the unstressed o becomes a uh. but there are like other vowels that are reduced and they, they follow a pattern that's never explained or also like in thai so i don't know if you've noticed that or what do you think of this if, if it's necessary or that contributes to like, I don't know, students not being able to have a better pronunciation? I, I think it's, you know, that's, it's one of those, you know, the, the chicken or the egg type uh, descriptions. I mean, uh, I think that um, most 
folks, when they come to the phonetic description, uh, I think they presume that people don't know how to understand or read IPA. So they say, you know, well, this sounds like the A in father. Well, who's father? You know, who's saying father? What, what, what way of saying father? And they just kind of uh, leave it at that. And because they aren't, people aren't challenged to learn the IPA, people don't know it. So it's a self-fulfilling thing. Um, so uh, definitely, um, I think that um, some, some ways of describing things would be, um, I don't know, it was actually in, in Hall's book, I forget where it was in, not, not this section, one or two sections back, it was kind of convoluted. And at first I thought that was ridiculous. But then when I actually tried it, I said, actually, that makes sense. He gave this long description of, of how to um, pull your tongue back and put something forward and just like, you know, sort of um, start saying this sound and then make this sound. And just, you know, if somebody could describe that patiently, you know, uh, like you did with the empanada or something, you know, give, give good examples. Um, but um, I, I kind of wonder also uh, nowadays, if I think the phonetic description is good and helpful, you know, in the hands of a trained phonetician to have that there. But if people have now more access to some recordings or audio, just listening to things is also probably um, uh, better helpful. So rather than telling people, it sounds like the A and father, just like listen to this carefully and, you know, say it, shadow it, that would, that would help. But um, I think it is an insoluble conundrum, what to do about describing the sounds of, of a language. Um, and I think that that kind of cycling back to probably literally things, if we have such a hard time describing the sounds of a a modern living language that's right next door to us that we can hear and see and test and, and see the many varieties. How can we possibly give an accurate sound description of some of a dead language that, you know, it's not fixed at any specific point in time and we don't have any recordings of it and we don't have, um, we don't have, you know, a, we can't possibly have an accurate idea of what, you know, it, it, it sounded like at this time at that time at the other time. So, Yes, it's important to look at that and you know to get some sort of idea, but not get hung up on it, you know, as, as some people do, and almost sort of figure maybe I, I shouldn't start learning it until I can know what the correct pronunciation is, because that's not something we're going to have. So, any other concluding thoughts, final thoughts, questions, things you wanted to ask or talk about that we didn't get to? Dave, you look like you have something on your mind. Um, I, I don't want to take this for another two hours, but. Um... In terms of, so when we talk about polyliteracy and we talk about learning a language diachronically, um, English is the easiest one, you know, to talk about because three of us are native English speakers. Um, you know, I, I got like some books that you recommended in when your, your old English video, the or the, maybe the middle English video, the old English standard English and the source book on the history of the English language or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you try to read that front from the front to the back, it's kind of the opposite of what you recommend doing which is to go back to front and so that's what i started doing is i read i read all the early modern english you know excerpts you know the dickens and like this and that i'm like oh okay you know i see how this is and because i've read things like that before i've read you know stuff from like jefferson and washington you know in my history degree and then i'm like okay let's now you read late middle english here's a bunch of sources on that and you can start seeing it and then but you know i'm doing the book in this convoluted way and i wonder if any language, you know, has, if, if there's a French one that's organized better or a German one that's organized better, or if that's something you think should be, someone should write, you know, say, okay, you know this current language, let's take you hundred years back at a time with, you know, a good, you know, little chunk of it and then explain what's going on. And then you can read one book and get to like, oh, okay, now I can feel middle and old English out. Now let me try to read, you know, Chaucer in full and so on and so forth. Uh, I do think I've seen little snippets of things like that. It's a great idea. Um, it would be a wonderful reader, you know, a, like a historical development, uh, uh, a historically developmental, a historical developmental reader of, say, English, of the English language in reverse chronological order. So you can you can read 20th century um, English now. Let's go back and look at some you know 19th century English and, and then we'll pull out some things that are different. Now let's look at some 18th century English. Let's look at some 17th century, 16th century, 15th century. Okay, and each time you'll be seeing a little more commonalities. And then you go back to the 14th century and you hit Chaucer and he's okay. 
Yeah, I think you'd still hit a gap because you know English wasn't really written or spoken for about 200 years. So when you go, you know, from from Chaucer to I don't know, the, the Doomsday Chronicles or something like that, that would be, you know, a bigger. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you yeah, know, yeah, it would definitely be a help. Yeah, I'd love. To I see think that. about that too. I think about you know, okay, I want to read. Let's if I want to read, you know, backwards in Icelandic to Old Norse or something, you know, but I go from reading you know something published now and then okay now i'm going to read the saga you know that's a thousand year difference you know i might i might need to do, or, or german you know if i should I, I should read 18th century german before i try to read you know the you know nibelungen or something in the original so um i would and or greek that's that's come up a lot in these talks is kind of mm -hmm. modern greek and then ancient greek and you know where do we draw these lines and you know, that well, would be a huge fat book because you have 3,000 years of uninterrupted history, and that would be really fascinating. Like, like, like at Katerina and back on here, and, and talk about the two forms of, of Greek that have been used until modern times. And then, you know, I think there was uh, in, in, in under the Ottoman Empire, you know, Greek was still like an official language, but I think it was, I think it was um, in, in the Greek things, I think it was heavily influenced by, by Turkish and stuff like that. There was Byzantine Greek had their various different stages. So, um, yeah, I think that would be a really neat way that, and from my, everything I understand is that although Greek has uh, changed a lot, I mean, it's, it's kind of comparable to, to English. I mean, from Homer to now is maybe like from Beowulf to now. So it's mm -hmm. twice as long, but not as much into Icelandic too, you know, written. So languages like that, where you do have unbroken continuity. I think that'd be fascinating to see uh, a reader that you know could take you back that way. I'm all for it. Wonderful. Cool. Yeah. Someone's got to write it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Any 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 last words from you, Paul? Um. Words, ideas. Yeah. One one final point, note, question, whatever. I think we talked a lot about the whole polyliteracy endeavor and polyglottery and ways we can keep building on it. Um, so I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, what advice would you want to give to people who are, you know, serious about doing this? And, you know, we touched on a lot of stuff today. We have a lot of other ideas that come about, but should we just keep going the way we're going and keep learning and getting the word out there or um, anything more that, you know, we can do to promote the whole endeavor, you know, what do you think uh, people like ourselves should be doing beyond what we've talked about, if anything? I think first and foremost, what you just said, uh, I think, you know, if this is to be a, um, have any, I mean, you need to walk the walk and talk the talk. I mean, you need to make this be authentic. So that's why I really appreciate it. Somebody like Matthew, you know, who, you know, uh, was on the first talk, you know, and he just came back on this one. He said, oh, because I, I haven't, sorry, I haven't been able to comment so much because I've been working on my study routine. And that's like, that's what you should be doing. I mean, it's, you know, um, so to, what we are proposing, you know, is a big life. There's lifelong learning and it's a big, you know, it's a big challenge. It's a big thing to take on to, you know, to say, I want to learn lots of languages, well so that I can go back and do diachronic explorations and do other things. And so I think it's, it is important that um, anybody who talks about that actually does it rather than just talking about it. You know, if you see people, you know, if you think if that, that would be the way to convince others in the academy who are skeptical of any kind of endeavor like that, that it is possible. So yes, first thing I would say is first and foremost, just yeah, keep, you know, Keep actually learning. Keep you know. Keep keep doing things. Keep developing a practice. Keep working at it. Um, and then beyond that, I have to give some more thought to you know like calls to action, what to do. But I, I promise I'll give it more thought. Um, that's a great question. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well. Um, Thank you very much for joining me. This, as also, I'm, I'm very much enjoying this whole process of having these um, conversations with people out there who are interested enough to, to watch my videos. And it's great to make the personal contact. Uh, I, we can't shake hands, but we're like <laughs> almost up to that, you know. But after years of, of corresponding or somehow knowing people, 
faces behind the, the, the comments and see what people's interests are. I think this is, um, that's part of the, the endeavor as well. So thank you all very much for uh, taking time to come here and share with us and uh, put our conversation out for the others to watch and listen to. And um, I think I would like to make this a, um, a regular continuing thing. So you know, as I said, I'd like to give other people a chance to uh, want to talk, but at a certain point, you know, people are you'll have a chance to come back and maybe meet each other again or meet some other people. And I think that would be really neat to keep having these conversations. So thank you all very much. And uh, I'll say good night to you, Dave, and, and good, good morning to start your days uh, to, to Paul and Daniel. And uh, we will see each other when we see each other. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.